Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us. This is Chris Fryan of Percenter Group, and I'm joined by Chris Brown as well. Thank you for joining our webinar today on Tuesday, January 20th on Conducting Workplace Investigations. Our webinar today is scheduled to run approximately 50 minutes, and we will have some time at the end for questions. So we ask that if you do have any questions as we go along, please enter them in the questions dialog box, and we'll have Chris address those at the end of the session. We do have quite a few participants on today's webinar, so uh, everyone's line is muted. So again, we do ask that you enter your questions via the questions box. At the end of the session, we're going to post a copy of today's webinar, the recording as well as the slides, to the Client Resource Center, so you can check those out shortly after today's webinar. Also, we have sent in this webinar for approval uh, to HRCI, so we're just waiting on that approval, and we expect to get that in the next couple days. So we will send an email to anybody who attended the session with that, um, with that code, so you can enter that in. So without further ado, I will turn it over to Chris to get us started for today. Chris? All right. Thanks, Chris. So today we're going to be talking about workplace investigations, and we're going to be talking about them somewhat generally, although I will get into some specific examples of investigations that you might have to conduct. Of course, there's a lot of reasons an employer might need to conduct an investigation, um, and we're going to talk about some of those. And of course, there's reasons that, that could be specific to your organization. Uh, for example, we work with uh, some uh, companies that, uh, well, companies that, uh, that provide um, uh, home health care and or take care of people who are uh, particularly vulnerable, and they might have to do investigations that go beyond what we're talking about here because of the unique circumstances that can arise uh, in their business. So um, when we talk about workplace investigations, uh, let's talk about some of the common, uh, common reasons they come up. So one of the most common is when we have any sort of discrimination or harassment claim. So Anytime we have an employee who is making a complaint that they have been discriminated or harassed, it's discriminated against or harassed, it's, it's going to require an investigation on the part of the employer. Um, you know, generally, there isn't you know, going to be you know, a complete admission of guilt on the part of whoever did the discriminating or harassment. And so as an employer, we're going to have to investigate the circumstances figure out what happened. Unfortunately, sometimes in discrimination and harassment cases, it kind of boils down to a he said, she said, he said, he said, she said, she said um, situation because, you know, the only people present at the time that whatever the conduct was that occurred were the complaining employee and the alleged harasser. So this, you know, this gets very challenging because oftentimes as an employer in these types of cases, we're trying to, you know, gauge who we believe to be the most credible, um, and and that can be a very difficult situation. But we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, unfortunately, there's no magic bullet when you're, you know, having to choose which of your two employees is telling the truth. Um, we also run across a lot of employers that have to conduct investigations for employee dishonesty, and and um, employee dishonesty takes a lot of different forms, and we'll talk about that later. But I mean, the most the most common is in any sort of retail environment where there's a concern about theft. Um, large retail firms often have large loss prevention departments that one of their, you know, one of the areas that they're always looking at besides just members of the public are employees. And so they may routinely have to investigate, you know, uh, funds that have gone missing or merchandise that's disappeared or whatever the case might be. And we have to make sure we conduct those investigations properly. Um, one that comes up frequently in certain sectors, particularly in the construction or manufacturing industries, are safety investigations. Anytime we've had any kind of a um, safety incident, um, we're going to have to investigate. And OSHA actually has some, you know, specific guidelines on how we're supposed to do that, which actually are kind of what we base a lot of our investigation process on because they they tend to look at this very very uh, strictly, and so kind of using their approach is good for almost any kind of investigation. Um, and of course, any incidents of workplace violence, which really kind of also fall under safety, um, would have to be investigated. Now, one of the issues, of course, with workplace violence is that you know if, if the violence is you know actively occurring 
we're going to call the cops. We're not going to, you know, investigate and try and decide what's going to happen. But oftentimes in workplace violence situations, what we're dealing with is that where someone has been threatened um, or there's been some conduct that, that, you know, leads us to believe or leads an employee to believe that they're at risk. And so we're investigating that. So, I mean, if the, you know, if, if you've got an employee beating up another employee, you're not going to say, okay, hold on, everybody, let's investigate. You're going to call the cops. But if, if, you know, someone's just been threatened, then, you know, that often is going to require some investigation. So, you know, we could pull out lots of cases on different situations where employers have done a lousy job investigating something. Um, so I just looked for one that was recent, and this one is from December. So um, pretty recent. Um, this happened to be an age discrimination case. I, really, it could have been any kind of discrimination case. Don't get hung up on the fact that it was age because these cases all pretty much work the same. Title VII, uh, which is the, you know, was the original and primary federal civil rights law that applied to um, employers, that's Title VII of the Civil Rights Acts of 1964 as amended, really provides the framework under which all discrimination and harassment cases follow. So even if this was because of disability, it would still work pretty much the same way. Um, Anyway, in this case, a former IBM vice president was awarded a $4.1 million, $4 million for uh, wrongful termination because the court determined that it was age-based. Um, in particular, and the reason I'm pointing to this case is that IBM was severely criticized because of how they handled the complaint. And so this is what we see over and over and over again in discrimination cases. The employer didn't have a good mechanism for for identifying when something's going on so they didn't have a good complaint mechanism or they had a complaint mechanism but then they did a lousy job investigating. Um, so in this case the judge specifically wrote that the purpose of the investigation appeared to be more to exonerate IBM than to determine if this employee was treated fairly and that's the kind of thing that courts don't like to see. They don't like to see an investigation where it just basically all boils down to hey, these are all the things that this employee, you know, this is a terrible employee, and they didn't actually look at the merits of their, of their complaint. And, and we see that pretty frequently. And so this is a good example of the cost of a poorly managed discrimination complaint. You know, I don't know what the cost would have been to IBM if they had not terminated this employee, but I'm guessing that they wouldn't have had to immediately pay out $4.1 million plus all the applicable court costs and attorney fees and everything else. So, you know, when we when we make these kind of mistakes, they can be pretty costly. Um, so when we do a thorough, prompt, and impartial investigation, we can it can, one, help the company from doing something stupid, like firing somebody who was legitimately discriminated against or harassed or threatened or whatever the case might be, but it also helps create that affirmative defense that we need to have in any sort of discrimination suit. Um, Any time we end up in court over discrimination, here's just sort of the basic way that it works. You have the employee, your former employee, who says, I was terminated because of my age. The, all that they need to meet as an initial burden is demonstrate that their age was somehow relevant, okay? Um, so they were over a certain age, the person who, was, who replaced them was younger. Um, Maybe the supervisor said something stupid. Who knows? That's all they kind of have to do. Then it, then it falls on the employer. So the employer then, and this, this, this was a change that occurred in the 1980s with the way these cases ran, then the employer effectively doesn't have to disprove, well, okay, doesn't have to, the employer, the burden isn't on the employee to prove that they were discriminated against based on age. They only have to prove that they were at, that they suffered some adverse consequence. The employer now has to turn around and prove that they didn't discriminate. And so that's the thing that throws a lot of employers off, is they're like, what? What do you mean I have to prove that something didn't happen? How do I do that? Well, the way you prove it is by demonstrating that, no, the reason this fellow was terminated or the reason he didn't get promoted or whatever the case was was because of, you know, A, B, C, and D. And this was the process we followed, and this is how we handled it, and this is how we investigated when he made the complaint. And this is how we, we establish our affirmative defense in this kind of case. So it really is on the employer. Um, all, all the burden of proof in these types of cases is on the employer, which I know employers don't like, but it's just the way it is. So when we talk about investigating discrimination and harassment complaints, 
you know, what is a discrimination harassment complaint? Well, I think it's always good to remind uh, businesses of all the different ways that someone can be discriminated or harassed. So we've got race, creed, color, religion, uh, nat national origin, citizenship status, immigration status, ethnic background, age for those individuals who are 40 and over, sex, gender, disability, veteran status, military status, marital status, sexual orientation, gender identity, pregnancy, genetic information, and anything else that is protected by law in your particular jurisdiction. Because some jurisdictions create unique uh, protected classes. Like, for example, there are some areas where you can't discriminate on the basis of home ownership. Not that that would be a good idea anywhere. Um, but, you know, we really have to look, um, you know, really closely anytime someone makes a complaint that they've been discriminated or harassed because there's so many rules and laws that protect different people for different reasons that, you know, it's not as simple as just, you know, looking at one one standard. So these are all the different the different ways um, <clears throat> that it can come up. Now workplace violence, one of the things we mentioned a minute ago, I mean the bad news is is that, you know, this is the the last data that we we're able to find. There were approximately, you know, almost 600,000 uh, non-fatal violent crimes uh, that occurred while people were at work, um, which was, you know, a quarter of all non-fatal violence against employed persons. Um, so it is something that happens with surprising frequency. A lot of employers are under the impression that, you know, we don't have to worry about workplace violence because, you know, we're not, and, and I get this a lot, and I don't want to pick on the post office, but people will say, you know, we're not the post office. Well, the only reason the post office has had workplace violence issues is because they're a huge employer. Every huge employer has had workplace violence issues. Um, and so it's easy to pick on the post office, but it's not really anything unique necessarily about the post office. It's just the more people you have, the more opportunities you have for workplace violence to occur. I've worked with relatively small employers that have had shootings. Um, but really, the, the most predominant forms of workplace violence are not where, where somebody comes in and gets shot. It's where we've got some altercation between employees or an altercation between an employee and a customer. Um, the people who are the most subject to workplace violence are nurses um, in hospitals. Nurses in hospitals, there's an incredibly high rate of violence against those individuals. And it's usually not other nurses that are attacking them. It's usually patients or family members or people who come into an emergency room and are altered or whatever the case might be. So workplace violence occurs all over the place. It's not just you know, when we have a shooting incident that we need to be thinking about workplace violence. There's all kinds of workplace violence. And we've done entire webinars on workplace violence. The good news on workplace violence, though, is that with violent crimes in general, and I know sometimes it's, it's hard to, to recognize this because, you know, violence gets so much attention in the news, and I'm not saying that it shouldn't, but that's just the reality is, is that overall violence in society has been going down, and that's been the case in the workplace as well. Um, so overall rates have been going down substantially. This was 1993 through 2009. So you can see the overall rates um, of, of just violence in general up here. Um, and then workplace violence have been going down pretty dramatically. So this is the good news. But it doesn't mean that we can just stop worrying about it. And, and, you know, it's not that we need to worry so much, but we just need to be aware and have policies and procedures in place to prevent workplace violence. And, of course, if there's any kind of complaint, our whole topic today is how do we investigate these things. If an employee comes in and complains, we need to take a look at it. And sometimes the mistake that employers make is that the the nature of the complaint isn't against another employee, so the employer thinks that, well, this is not really in our, our domain as the employer. You're making a complaint about your, you know, relative or your, you know, ex-boyfriend or, you know, a customer. That's, you know, we can't control what those people do. The reality is, is that while people are on your premises under the OSHA general duty clause, you have an affirmative obligation to keep them safe. It doesn't matter where the threat is coming from. And so if you have an employee that has a relative come in and, you know, beat them up, you have a problem. It doesn't matter that it wasn't another employee that uh, committed the violent act. And so under that, you know, general duty clause under OSHA, and this is what we've got right here, an employer must keep your employees safe, period. doesn't matter where it's coming from. 
So if you're a medical provider and your employees are always getting beat up by the people that you serve, you can't just say, oh, well, that's just an occupational risk. Sorry, I can't do anything about it that the patients keep beating you up. If you're an employer and you've got someone's, you know, crazed friend or family member who's come around making threats that they're going to do things, you can't just blow it off and say, hey, you've got to deal with that at home. If it's occurring in the workplace, you've got to take affirmative steps to prevent that from causing an injury or physical harm to any of your employees. So one of the things, and you know, this webinar isn't on violence in the workplace, but one of the things that we need to have as part of any violence prevention program is that we've designated someone who's responsible for implementation. We deal with how we're going to inspect and we deal with how we're going to investigate, how we're going to correct hazards as they occur, and of course how we're going to train employees. That's all part of our, you know, if you want to go back and watch one of our Violence in the Workplace uh, webinars, we get into a lot of that in more, in more detail. So those recorded webinars are out there, and, you know, if we touch on something that might be, you know, of further interest to you, go back and look at that, because there's, you know, a whole 40 or 50 minute um, presentation on that. Now, let's talk about safety, because this is one that comes up a lot in certain sectors. So OSHA expects a full investigation of all injuries. So if you have someone who gets hurt on the job, it is not just, oh, let's report to the work comp carrier and, and life goes on. That's not the way OSHA looks at it. OSHA expects a full investigation of all injuries. And in just a minute, we're actually going to look at some guidance directly from OSHA on how they expect for this kind of thing to be investigated. Because they provide some fairly specific guidance on how they think that employers should do it, which we should listen to. They also expect investigations of what are called near misses. Lots of employers don't do this. So you have some beam come crashing down, and it doesn't hurt anybody, but it could have hurt somebody. That's a near miss. We don't just you know, say, oh, well, we were lucky this time, so let's, we don't have to investigate anything. No, we have to investigate that too. Employers can be cited for failing to properly mitigate hazards. Well, if you're not even investigating what went wrong and somebody got hurt, then you certainly aren't properly mitigating hazards. So what are the OSHA... What is OSHA looking for? And I know this, this text is kind of small, so you might want to pull down the PowerPoint when we're done if you want to look at this, but this comes directly from OSHA. So they want all incidents, whether near miss or an actual injury, to be investigated, okay? We're supposed to investigate so we can control hazards before they cause a more serious incident. Accident, accident or incident investigation are a tool for uncovering hazards, okay? They are not a tool for just blaming employees, which we're going to get to later. I've looked at a lot of employers' investigations, particularly in regards to workplace safety, and the answer always is, well, you know, this employee didn't follow procedure. Okay, well, how is it you have so many employees who weren't following procedures? How is it you have so many employees who are making mistakes? OSHA does not want to see that. Okay, they do not want to see you just blaming individual people for accidents. They want to see what were the systemic issues that allowed for these accidents to occur. How is it that, you know, you have people who are getting hurt on the job? There should be processes and procedures and protections in place to help prevent that kind of thing. You remember under the OSHA general duty clause, clause you have an affirmative obligation to prevent workplace injuries. You know, and it's general duty that doesn't even have to be a specific OSHA standard. Um, so it's not just to discover every contributing factor to the accident or incident uh, to foolproof the condition or actively prevent further future incidents. In other words, your objective is to identify root causes, not primarily to set blame. So that's what I talked about earlier. So an accident is an undesired event that results in personal injury or property damage. So that's how they define an accident. An incident is any unplanned, undesired event that adversely affects completion of a task. So if those beams all fell down, nobody got hurt, it's still an incident, even though it is not an accident. And if that could have resulted in people getting hurt, so if it's an incident that could have caused injury, so if we just say, yeah, all those steel beams fell down, but nobody got hurt, aren't we lucky? I was just going to say, yeah, but what if an employee was standing there? Now, if you say, oh, well, that could have never happened because we've got all these safety barriers and they were all standing behind giant concrete walls, and so, you know, the beams fell in the beam falling area where it's okay, then okay, then maybe it wasn't a near miss. But if that wasn't the case, and absent somebody standing a few feet one direction or the other, 
they're going to consider that a near miss, which should have been fully investigated. So keep in mind, it's not just when people get hurt that we're investigating under OSHA. It's also in circumstances where something went wrong, whatever it was, and it could have resulted in an injury. Um, like they say, if there's a slight shift in time or position, it could have occurred. Um, and so that's something that they get very upset about if they find out that, hey, those beams have fallen, you know, half a dozen times and we just haven't done anything about it because nobody's gotten hurt. They're not going to like that. They're going to almost certainly cite that employer for a whole bunch of stuff um, because they should have taken action the first time they fell so that it didn't happen again. So who should conduct our investigations? And this is, you know, this is what OSHA is saying, but this is generally good advice good guidance uh, overall, and we've got some other guidance in here that we're going to look at as well, but the usual investigator for the accidents is the supervisor in charge of the involved area or activity because, in theory, they know the most about what was going on. Now, this does not apply when we're talking about something like a harassment complaint. Then we don't necessarily want the supervisor conducting the harassment because they may be too close. They may be too involved in what was going on. So. Like I said, this is kind of good general guidance, but in certain circumstances we deviate from that. And I've got some, some other guidance that I'm going to show you on investigating other types of, of incidents. Um, employee involvement will not only give you additional expertise and insight, but in the eyes of the workers will lend credibility to the results. So it shouldn't just be the supervisor. It should be all the employees who were involved, or maybe not all the employees, some subset of the employees who were involved, because they may know why those beams fell. They may know what you know, what safety precaution wasn't taken or why this has been a problem or whatever the case. Usually, it's going to be a team approach. And some employers will have a, you know, an established committee that is involved in investigating um, any, in any business where there's, you know, a high chance of an occupational injury should have a safety committee. And that safety committee may be involved in investigating, or they may have established some subgroup that's involved in investigating, so we can have some consistency in these types of investigations. But one of the things that we should do is we should always train people ahead of time so they know how to investigate an accident. Now, once again, this is specific to OSHA, but this also applies to other circumstances. We shouldn't have people investigating harassment complaints who we've never trained about harassment. Doesn't make sense. They're just going to maybe dismiss things that were relevant or they might even make things worse because of the way they handle the investigation. Um, so it's very important that whoever's involved in any workplace investigations have been trained so that they're familiar with the general area, you know, the general type of investigation that they're going to be conducting. Um, so there's also a, you know, documents available from government agencies. So for example, they talk here about the National Safety Council has got this pamphlet on accident investigation and you know, some of what is in here is based on that. So once we have a report, it should answer several key questions. These are who, what, when, where, why, and how. Um, so these are kind of standard questions, nothing magical here. But facts need to be distinguished from opinion and they need to be presented clearly. So it can't be, well, we think that the beams fell because so-and-so made a mistake. It needs to be, well, the beams fell. We identify that you know, a retaining clip was missing. Um, we identify that this is who was responsible for the retaining clip. We identify that this person you know, hadn't been properly trained on using the retaining clip or whatever. I'm kind of making things up here, but i um, kind of making up an accident as I go. But we need to make sure that we're very clearly stating the facts and not just saying, well, you know, the beams fell because this guy didn't do his job right. That's not going to satisfy OSHA, and it's not going to create a good process if you have a more serious uh, accident. There's usually going to be multiple contributing factors and therefore multiple preventive actions. So in our beam falling incident, well, yeah, one problem is that the retaining clip was missing. but the reason the retaining clip was missing is because we had an employee who wasn't properly trained. Um, and the reason that even we didn't catch it to still is because we didn't have a two-man rule. We should have had a two-man rule, meaning that, hey, employee A puts in the clip, employee B checks to make sure the clip is in place because it's such a safety-critical issue. 
So usually there's multiple contributing factors and there's going to be multiple preventive actions. So in our example, so we're going to provide additional training to the employee. We're going to better identify where the clip is supposed to be placed, put up warning signs. We're going to institute a two-man rule, meaning that when the safety clip is put in, another employee confirms that it was put in correctly. Where you've got critical safety issues, you've got to have good processes and procedures in place to avoid uh, those kind of injuries. You've got to stay out of the, the trap of blaming just an employee. And a lot of times, we blame the person who gets hurt. So in my in my example, nobody got hurt when the beams fell. But let's say that you have an employee who's who's you know operating a machine and they you know they have a, a major laceration. They cut themselves, you know, and they end up in the hospital and have to have lots of stitches. I mean, you know, who knows? One of the easiest things to do, and we see it happen all the time, uh, is the employee um, basically just takes the fall. Well, the reason that Joe got his arm cut off is because, you know, Joe's an idiot and he wasn't operating, they may not say idiot, but, you know, Joe wasn't operating the machine properly. Okay, well, why in the world do we have employees who are operating machines improperly? That's the question. And that's what OSHA wants to see. And that's what any good investigation process is going to reveal. Okay, why in the world do we have employees who who are operating machines incorrectly without some corrective action having having already been taken? Um, that should have been something that we identified right away. Um, you know, we should be conducting regular inspections to see that someone's using a machine without a proper safety guard, or they're holding material incorrectly, or that they've got uh, clothing that interferes with their ability to do their job. Um, this isn't something that we just, oh, he did it incorrectly. There's a reason he was able to do it incorrectly. According to OSHA, it was the employer's job to prevent that injury from occurring. Okay, And that meant we had proper training, we had proper safety protocols, we were doing inspections, we were doing everything right, and somehow in spite of doing everything right, something still went wrong. Now we investigate and figure out how something still went wrong. But it's not just because Joe is an unsafe employee. And this is one of those things that I'm very emphatic about because you are going to get cited. If you have a bunch of injuries and they come out and they look at all your injury investigations and your injury reports and every one of those is just, oh, it was some employee who did something wrong, some employee who did something wrong, they are going to be unhappy. OSHA can find problems at every employer. Even if they can't find specific violations, they can always cite you under the general duty clause. You are going to get in trouble. They want to see that you are finding actual problems and you are mitigating those problems so that this does not occur again. All right? And it may require a total redesign of a process. You know, sometimes maybe the entire way you were having this guy do the job was inherently unsafe. I mean, we run into that all the time. Where you know what? It turns out there's the problem is the way we had designed the job. The problem is the way we had configured the equipment. Um, you know. That's okay to identify, but then you have to be ready to do something about it. If you conduct that investigation and you figure out that, well, hey, it was inherently, you know, um, unsafe from the outset, okay, uh, the way we were having this person do this job, then you better do something about it, okay? So I'm sorry if I'm really getting preachy on the safety stuff, but this is an area where we see employers get in trouble all the time. Um, Everybody who is involved in the investigation needs to make sure that they that their descriptions of what you know the causes were are careful and clear. Um, we need to make sure that we look out and we don't you know have just these generic like they say for example you know it shouldn't say employee did not plan job properly. Um, this 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 once again is just blaming it on the employee. And this is what OSHA says. This isn't just what Chris says. Okay, this I took all this directly from OSHA. They do not want to see these super easy generic explanations of somebody just messed up, somebody didn't do a good job, somebody wasn't doing their job safely. They want to see actual causes. So the implications of our accident investigation is that we're going to do something. And so here's the next area where we see employers make a mistake. And this is not just investigating accidents. This is in all kinds of investigations. So we went and did this investigation, all right? We recommended we figured out what was wrong. We should have recommended preventive actions, okay? 
should we should figure out all the ways that we could effectively prevent this from ever occurring again all right what is it? i mean whatever it is anything all right how can we prevent this from happening again don't get hung up on the cost or engineering issues at this point the 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 initial point is how could we prevent it from happening then we go back later and then we do all the necessary hazard prevention and control, which is going to take into account costs and engineering limitations. So, you know, there isn't a robot that can do that job. So that's not an option. We have to have a human do that job. So it'd be great if we could get a robot to do it. Can't get a robot to do it. So what's next on the list of ways that we could prevent this from occurring again? And a lot of times we're going to have to do multiple job safety analysis because we might go out and revise the way that Joe does his job watch it for a while, we may say, well, we still see that there's a hazard because there's still this part of his job that's inherently unsafe. We haven't fully mitigated the hazard. Well, now we need to go back, re-engineer that a little bit. What other controls can we put in place? How else can we make that job as safe as it can possibly be? There's always going to be risks associated with certain jobs. So you're not, they're not asking you to do the impossible, which is eliminate all risk. They're asking you to identify all the risks, look at all the ways that the risks could be mitigated, and then take the best action that you could to prevent that injury from occurring again. So, and really, if you use those same principles when you're investigating other types of incidents, you're going to be in pretty good shape. There's, there's some the different nuances, but, and we'll talk about those, but really, if we just kind of apply those general principles, you know, we're going to do pretty well. <laughs> All right, so let's go to the next thing. Employee dishonesty. So um, I get calls all the time uh, from businesses. Uh, uh, the, um, the, somebody calls up, hey, we had tools go missing. What do we do? Well, do you have any idea what, you know, <laughs> what, um, what went missing or why? I mean, did, did you have anything to go on? Oh, we have no idea. You know, can we just go and question all the employees. Well, I mean, yeah, you can question all the employees, but what do you expect to get out of that? So we have lots of reasons that these employee dishonesty issues come up. Um, and, you know, it's, it's, it's challenging um, to, you know, make a determination. Um, sometimes exactly what happened, but let's kind of talk generally about, you know, how all of this should, should play out. So um, for starters, when we're looking at employee dishonesty, we've got theft. Stuff went missing. You know, that's, like I said, I get called all the time. Something's gone. We have fraud. I see a lot of employers that have had an employee who was, you know, purchasing things with a company credit card and lying about them that was, you know, pilfering money from accounts or customer accounts. Comes up quite a bit. Time card falsification is probably one of the ones we see most frequently um, where, you know, an employer has got somebody who's consistently booking, you know, overtime hours and there's some real doubt as to whether or not that overtime ever actually occurred. Um, in which case, you know, we're going to want to investigate and see what evidence do we have to back up this, uh, you know, this use of overtime. Um, Damage to property. So there's some company property that was damaged, a vehicle, a machine, a uh, facility, and we want to hold an employee accountable for that. So sometimes that's because an employee was doing something wrong. Other times it was an accident. So these are the kind of things that we see. One thing that you can't do, um, and boy, I, a lot of employers uh, want to do it, um, is, you know, hey, can I hook my employees up to a lie detector? And it's surprising uh, that employees still ask, employers still ask, because the, um, there's been a law about this for a long time. Uh, this is not a new law. And there are actually some circumstances where you can hook employees up to polygraphs, but in general, the Employee Polygraph Protection Act prohibits most employers from using a polygraph in any pre-employment or general employment inquiry, okay? doesn't apply to federal, state, or local government agencies. So like, for example, a government that's hiring police officers, they almost always hook employees up to polygraphs. And, and we won't get into a debate about how useful a polygraph actually is in that context. We'll just go with um, the fact that they do it, and we'll have to accept that. Regular employers, though, can't, okay? 
and we certainly can't use any results that we somehow gained in an illegal polygraph to influence our employee selection process. Um, certain jobs, all right, where there's a high risk can use a polygraph for pre-employment. So the examples that they give are alarm companies, security guards. Um, there are some exceptions under the Employee Polygraph Protection Act where for certain high-risk occupations you can still do a pre-employment post-offer. Post All of any kind of employee testing is always done post-offer. And if you have any questions about how to do that employee testing, we did a whole webinar on employee selection procedures. And what you'll find is that there may be certain things that you're doing right now as part of the application process that you shouldn't be doing until after you've made a conditional job offer, but that is an entirely separate webinar. But in any case, there are a couple of industries where you can do polygraphs, but in most industries you can't. Now, here's where you might be able to. Persons reasonably suspected in theft or embezzlement from a company that results in a specific economic loss may be subject to a polygraph. So this is why employers will still come back and say, okay, you know, we had so there was a, a employer that contacted me and they had a bunch of um, computer equipment stolen, all right? And they were kind of a technology company and so this was stolen out of their warehouse. And they said, okay, so we've lost this stuff. There's a specific loss. So does that mean we can go and polygraph all of our employees? Well, here's the question. Do you have grounds to reasonably suspect any, you know, have reasonable suspicion, reasonable suspect, that's not really a, a statement. Do you have reasonable suspicion regarding any particular employees um, that would allow you to do that? Um, if you don't, okay, um, then you probably can't do it. You can't just do a blanket, hey, I'm going to polygraph, I'm going to polygraph everybody because it sounds fun. You know, I, I'm going to find out who did this, so I'm going to hook all of my employees up to a polygraph until I find the employee who sold the stuff. You have to have other evidence that's pointing in that direction, okay, before you hook anybody up to a polygraph. And you certainly are going to want to get legal advice before you hook anybody up to a polygraph because of the, you know, substantial, substantial legal exposure um, you have associated with doing any kind of uh, polygraph. Um, so if you've got that very specific evidence that's pointing to, you know, some particular person, um, then perhaps, and I'll say perhaps, um, you, can, you can do that. But um, otherwise, you know, you can't just go and polygraph all of your employees because you think that maybe there's a possibility that that one of them was involved in this theft. You would have to have other evidence that was already pointing pointing that direction. Um, and that's where we, you know, often run into problems because the employer doesn't really have any other evidence. They just say, well, there were ten employees who had access to the warehouse. Okay, that's that's not evidence. That's just saying that you have ten employees who had access to the warehouse. Do you have like key fobs that indicated that an employee came in at a particularly weird time? Um, do you have some other evidence that points at a particular employee? Um, because that's what they're really expecting here. Um, they're not expecting just that, oh, well, somebody had access. They're expecting that you've got some other evidence um, that points in that direction. Um, and that's what you're going to need before you're hooking anybody up to a polygraph. And you're going to want legal advice, you know, <laughs> You want legal advice if you ever get into that situation. So what are some tips and tricks um, on doing investigations just in general? Um, always start the investigation and interviews right after whatever the situation is that arises. So in, uh, you know, in safety, you know, once you've got administered first aid, sent somebody off to the ER, whatever was, was applicable, you're going to investigate. You need to investigate as soon as you can before witnesses, documents, everything else disappears. And things aren't necessarily disappearing because someone's covering something up. Sometimes they're just disappearing because people didn't realize it was important. Um, we want to hold individual interviews to uphold confidentiality and minimize peer pressure. So after we, that accident occurred, we're going to interview everybody who was standing around when the accident occurred. If we have a harassment complaint, we're going to interview everybody who was present at the time that the harassment allegedly occurred. And we're going to do that one-on-one. -on -one. 
we're not going to bring 20 people in and interview them at the same time because then there's a lot of peer pressure that can become a factor. So we want to try and keep things as confidential as possible while recognizing that there's no way that we can truly investigate some situations while keeping total confidentiality. I run into this a lot in sexual harassment complaints. You've got an employee who feels that they were harassed. The employer's trying to investigate. The employee who was harassed is like, oh, well, you know, I don't want you to tell anybody what happened. Well, here's the problem. I can't investigate your harassment complaint unless I'm able to go out and talk to people about what occurred, which means that I'm going to have to at least give them some information. Now, I don't have to tell them all the lurid details, but I'm at least going to have to provide them with some information um, before we're able to find out what happened. And that's, you know, one problem. We have to try and stay objective, which is where, you know, OSHA recommends that you have supervisors conduct an investigation because they're often be a major part of the investigation because they're often the most familiar with things from a safety standpoint. But in other types of investigations, the supervisor might be the least objective person. If you've got a harassment or discrimination complaint, mm, the supervisor may not be the right person to do the investigation. In, in fact, they probably aren't the right person to do the investigation. Take good notes. If it's legal to record it, record it. In most states, as long as everybody's okay with it, you can record it. It's a little more complicated if they don't want to be recorded. Uh, it varies from state to state. Uh, hold the interview in a, pri a private, quiet location. Never promise absolute confidentiality. I kind of already jumped ahead on this. Tell them that we're going to do our most to protect confidentiality. But look, if you tell me that you know you saw employee A, you know, inappropriately touching employee B, employee A is going to know that you were one of the ones who who told us because we've got to disclose to them. And potentially, if we end up in litigation, we may have to explain who the witnesses were. Um, we don't have to do it during the investigation process, but we probably will if we're actually going to terminate someone. So never promise absolute confidentiality. Keep interviews on track. That's the case with any kind of interview. Don't interrupt while people are giving potentially revealing your useful information. Start out with really general questions and move down to things that are really closely focused to questions that, that relate to detail. So, you know, start off with what happened. Okay, what did you see? All right, what do you know about? the specific incident, you know, get into more detail as you go. Uh, rephrase questions different ways to kind of see if maybe there's a slightly different answer depending upon how you ask it. A lot of times, as I mentioned early on, we're measuring the credibility of employee A versus employee B. Well, if employee A's statements keep changing, then it would be rational to believe that they are less credible absent some other extenuating circumstances. Um, avoid confrontational or accusatory questions. This is not, you know, law and order. We're not going to, you know, <laughs> try and trick them into, uh, I don't know if they did that on law and order, but some of these cop shows where they, like, really intimidate somebody and get them to, you know, spill their, spill the beans. Um, pay attention to their body language. This could have something to do with credibility. You know, not the most fun to end up in court arguing that, well, you know, we took this action because we believe employee A was lying, employee B was telling the truth. If you have good reasons, then make sure you document all of that. Of course, it's all going to be questioned if you end, end up in court anyway. Um, just be quiet after you ask a question and see what people say. Sometimes if you're quiet for a little while, some people are just nervous and they're just going to, you know, tell you everything you wanted to know without asking any additional questions. This isn't like a job interview where the last thing we want someone to do is volunteer information. In an investigation, we want people to volunteer information. Um, so this is a very useful tool. And be ready with follow-up questions. Sometimes you have to do more than one interview. Here are some common mistakes that uh, were recently published in, uh, in, in HR magazine that I thought were good. Don't go into an investigation without having some kind of a plan. Um, worst mistake is to ignore complaints entirely. I mean, you've, you've, you've got, you know, if you've got people complaining about something, you've got to investigate. Don't delay investigations. Just like we said before, the longer we delay it, the more likely we are to lose evidence, to have documents that are missing, to have people who don't remember anything. Um, all of that occurs. Um, try not to lose objectivity. That's really tough because a lot of times you may know these people personally, and so it's really tough to be totally objective with people who you work with every day. Um, don't get distracted during interviews. Try and stay really focused. 
Uh, don't use aggressive interview tactics. We talked about that earlier. Um, make sure we're always conducting a thorough in investigation. This is kind of the opposite of all the stuff we just said. Um, never just leave investigation open. We always have to have some sort of conclusion. The conclusion could be we couldn't find enough evidence. You know, employee A said employee B did something. We couldn't find any evidence. It wasn't that serious of an infraction. We've counseled both employees on what to do should something like this occur again. That's the conclusion. But don't just keep it open forever. Always create some sort of written report. You know, sometimes employers don't like to put anything in writing because they're afraid it will be used against them. But if you do it right, this is also, you know, Exhibit A if you end up in court. And then uh, make sure that we always follow up with those who were involved to make sure that whatever occurred isn't occurring again. All right. So I've got a bunch of forms here I'm just going to fly through real quickly that, that we provide to employers to kind of help them with some of this stuff. Here's just a, a guide that we put together on effective investigation processes. It really just goes through a lot of the things that we talked about. It does talk a little bit about credibility. We pull all this from the government, so this isn't just stuff that we made up on our own, but you know, it is really tough when we're trying to determine credibility of witnesses and we've got employees who are telling us different things. Um, Here's sort of a guide on how to complete a, um, a harassment investigation. We've got a bunch of forms that go along with that. Um, the first thing is we're going to ask the, um, the complainant a whole bunch of questions. You know, what happened? Where did it occur? When did it occur? Is it still happening? How did you react to it? That how did you react is really important in, in harassment complaints because, for example, particularly in sexual harassment, the, the conduct has to have been unwelcome. Now, I don't want to get into a big debate about you know what is and isn't welcome, but if an employee is you know if employee A is flirting with employee B and employee B is flirting right back, that would indicate to employee that the con employee A that the conduct was not unwelcome, meaning that we probably can't fire employee A for being employee A for being engaged in some flirtatious behavior when the other employee was throwing it right back. Now, if employee B decides they don't like it anymore, then we've got to stop it. In fact, we probably should stop at the moment we're made aware of it because it could escalate into something worse. But we can't fire somebody if, if the other person was engaged in the exact same conduct, and, and that happens frequently. Um, what did you do? How has it affected you? Did you tell anyone else about it? Are there any other witnesses? All this stuff is stuff we're going to collect up front, get their signature. We're going to ask them to write out or type up a statement of what actually occurred in their own words. This is going to be an important document later if this becomes a bigger issue. Then we're going to go talk to the, oh, then we're going to kind of summarize it all so we've got, so we can go and talk to the alleged harasser. What did they do? What did they see? What is their take on it? Get a statement from them. You know, we've got to treat them fairly too. So this is different than like a safety investigation. Um, this is where we're really looking at two different people who have different views on, on the same thing that happened. Although, as you can see, a lot of these different types of investigations are going to have similar, similar um, components. Um, then we've got to go out and talk to third parties. Now, this is something we do in every kind of investigation, no matter what it is. If we had an injury, we're going to talk to everybody who was present. Harassment, everybody who was present. Workplace violence, everyone who was present. We want to hear from everybody who might know anything, including those people who didn't see anything. One of the biggest problems that I see come up over and over again, and particularly harassment complaints, is that you've got people who come out of the woodwork three years later when you finally end up in court who all of a sudden have got all of this interesting information on what they supposedly saw that now you've got to try and disprove. So if somebody didn't see anything, have them fill out this form right here that says, I didn't see anything. That makes it a lot harder later on for them to come back and change their story and say, oh, yeah, I saw the whole thing, and clearly employee A was at fault, employee B was you know, being harassed constantly. Um, just as a reminder on the anti-harassment and anti-discrimination stuff, we've got to give notice to employees. That's not what really this, this webinar is about. But I just want to remind you that on a lot of the stuff, we do have to have policies and notifications that have gone out to employees ahead of time, in part putting the burden on them to make us aware of when there is an incident. Because, of course, we can't investigate something if we're never told that it even occurred. So I only went slightly over my 50 minutes. I'm happy to answer any and all questions right now, even if they might seem a little bit, you know, uh, complex. We're always happy to address those as best we can in the webinar because somebody else might be thinking the same thing. 
All right, thank you very much, Chris. And uh, we've got a couple questions about the slides. Uh, so just as a reminder, those will be posted to the Client Resource Center uh, very shortly after today's presentation, along with the recording. Um, just one other question here about the, um, the documents you showed. Are those, uh, where are those kept, Chris? Um, if you ask your, uh, your Procential broker, we can get those to you through your Procential broker. Um, happy to send those along. Uh, so just whoever invited you to the webinar, contact them and they can get in touch with us and we can make sure that you get those documents. Excellent. Well, that appears to be uh, the last question. We'll hang on for Gosh. another uh, minute. We're talking about like, every kind of investigation there is and I expected a lot of questions. It's hard to predict that. Uh, but please, if you do have questions, put them in. I know that, you know, we covered a lot of a lot of different areas and maybe you were only really concerned about a certain type of investigation, but the principles are very similar. The differences kind of come down to how you, you know, who conducts it, you know, and how you handle certain aspects of it. But in general, the key is is, is we're going to want to investigate right away. We're going to want to get statements from everybody who is even remotely involved and we're going to want to be able to demonstrate that we took some sort of corrective action, whether it's an injury on the job, workplace violence, employee dishonesty, whatever it is, we're going to want to you know, get those statements, conduct a quick investigation, and be able to show that we took some sort of corrective action that was appropriate um, to whatever the, the incident was. All right, glad we waited. We do have a few more questions here. Oh, they keep coming, so that's good. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the next one here. Uh, I knew they were out there. <laughs> what are your obligations to an eligible employee who quits because of an alleged incident before you can conduct the investigation? Well, so it all depends on your policies and procedures. So, um, so what you're talking about there is a potential claim of what's called constructive discharge. So constructive discharge is where you have somebody who quits, but they could come back later and they could argue that, well, yeah, I quit, technically I quit, but the reason I quit is because my working conditions were so insufferably horrible, terrible, that I had no, nothing, no option but to quit. The way we protect ourselves from that, particularly in regards to harassment and discrimination, is that we train that employee like day one, all right, as soon as we've onboarded them. We train them. We don't, ex we don't tolerate harassment. We don't to tolerate discrimination. Here's our policy. Here's who you, who you contact. If if you're harassed or discriminated against. We want to put the burden on the employee that if something goes wrong, that they're going to let us know what it was so that we can take that corrective action. If we didn't do that, if we haven't shifted that burden to the employee, then yeah, we've got a problem because they could say, oh, well, you know, I was being harassed from day one and I didn't know who I was supposed to tell, I didn't know what the process was, and then we could have some liability. So the, the best way that we protect ourselves in that situation is through training and good policies and procedures. Okay. Is it always the HR's responsibility to ensure an investigation takes place? If, an, if a harassment happens in the field and the HR in the office is not informed immediately, can this be handled immediately on the field by the supervisor? HR should always be involved, I believe, simply because HR is more likely to be neutral in this situation. So I've seen a lot of harassment uh, problems where you have you know, employees out in the field. In fact, I dealt with one recently where it was two male employees and one basically, I mean, it was probably sexual assault. I mean, he really grabbed the other guy in a very inappropriate way. Um, and uh, you know, the supervisor tried to deal with it without really getting HR involved. And, you know, one employee was friendly with the supervisor and the other one wasn't, and so that's what happens, is that when you're just letting, like, supervisors deal with it, there's always these interpersonal relationship issues that can kind of cloud their judgment or, at a minimum, make it appear that they're acting in a way that's biased. So it's always good for HR, senior management, somebody, somebody besides just the supervisor, to be involved so that they can try and ensure that, that the process is objective and we're not favoring one employee over another um, because that's where the whole thing can kind of fall apart. All right, next question here. Um, in, in, uh, re related to small businesses, how does the process and rules change? 
Well, so it depends on how small you are, okay? So, of course, if you have less than 15 employees, you're not covered by the majority of federal anti-discrimination law. So some, some employers <laughs> mistakenly think that that means that they can have, you know, nonstop harassment going on and it's no big deal because we have less than 15 employees. Well, two issues. One, often there's federal and sometimes even local laws that then apply to smaller employers that afford very similar rights and protections as you would see under the federal um, anti-discrimination, anti-harassment laws. Two, even if there's no law, they can still sue you. I mean, there are sexual harassment cases against individuals. You know, I mean, you can, you know, it's still something they can sue you over. So, so I believe that all employers, regardless of size, should prevent harassment and discrimination and investigate appropriately if something is reported. Now, the likelihood of ending up in court is obviously dramatically lower if you're a very small employer and there's no specific laws that protect an individual or no specific agencies who are going to get involved in investigating it. You know, the EEOC is not going to come out and investigate a harassment complaint at a company with three people. They're just not going to do it because Title VII doesn't apply. Um, now, workplace safety, whole different story. OSHA applies to all employers regardless of size. All right? So, if you have an on, if you've got a, a, if you're in the what's called the high risk category under OSHA, they don't really care how many employees you have. You're held to the exact same standard as a gigantic company. So it really depends on what kind of investigation we're talking about. Um, it, you know, like Title VII type investigations. You know, if you're a smaller employer, your exposure is a little less because you know the EOC isn't get involved. But if it's a safety issue, then your exposure is identical because OSHA doesn't care how large you are. If you're doing something dangerous and you're in that high-risk category, you're held to the exact same standards regardless of size. So just depends. Okay, and so I think you, you answered the question. The person did say uh, uh, maybe a five-person company, so I think you stated that less than 15. So. Yeah, 15 is the major cutoff on, on – there are a couple things that go up to 20, but I just like to use 15 as the to keep it simple. 15 is the major cutoff for most of the federal anti-discrimination laws, but there's exceptions, okay? So for example, USERA, the law that protects against discrimination uh, based upon military status, applies to all employers. Uh, you know, uh, the uh, Immigration Reform and Control Act, which applies to nationality and citizenship status or immigration status, applies to all employers. So that's why I say it's best as a practice just to not discriminate. <laughs> Um, uh, keeping track of which laws apply to you could, could be a little crazy sometimes. Okay, and uh, last question here. What if a witness doesn't want to participate in a harassment investigation? Well, you know, then we get into what I sort of generally refer to as employee insubordination. So if you've got an employee who was standing there when all those beams fell, and you're asking them to fill out a statement about what they saw, and they refuse to complete a statement, that employee is, by definition, being insubordinate. Now, what are you going to do about it? Um, if they're an at-will employee, in theory, you know, you can terminate them for any reason at any time, with or without notice, move on. Real life, of course, things aren't that simple. So we would have to really consider what kind of disciplinary action we were going to take if somebody was just refusing to sign off on a form. Maybe they've got a good reason for not signing off on the form. You know, maybe they've been threatened by their supervisor. I mean, who knows what's going on? But, but you know, in general, if, if you've got an employee who was present or, or has got, you know, is likely to have relevant information and they're just like, no, man, I refuse to get involved. I'm not going to do anything. They don't really have that option because you're their employer, and if, if they don't follow directions, that's a you know insubordination. What are you going to do about it? That's where you want to talk to a lawyer because if I fire somebody and it turns out that the reason they wouldn't cooperate in a harassment investigation is because they were also being harassed, I've got a problem, you know, and that's why we need to be careful what we do. But in theory, you can require them to cooperate. All right. Thank you very much, uh, Chris, for your uh, 
Great presentation and the answers to those, or the, yeah, the answers to those questions. Uh, thanks a lot, also for the folks that joined us today, as well as your questions. Uh, we do have a couple other questions that uh, we'll follow up via email with those individuals, so we appreciate those as well. Um, keep an eye out for our upcoming webinars on the Client Resource Center. We do have a couple others uh, this month, as well as. Um, you know, beyond that as well. So thanks again, everyone. Have a great day, and we look forward to talking with you soon.